What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of Be Shafe Daily Live as we're breaking down a Cardinal loss tonight, unfortunately. I know, I know, 9-8 to the Marlins, uh, another extra inning game as the Cardinals get an offensive eruption in this one. You get homers from Paul Goldschmidt, from Alec Burleson, from Brendan Donovan, and you wasted them all. Man, did the offense look good in the early innings tonight, scoring at will for the first, what, the first four innings in this game. And then they kind of tapered off until getting the Manfred man home in the 10th. But uh, the Marlins got two home in the bottom of the 10th off of Chris Roycroft to win this game. It is a shame that you finally get that game you were waiting to see from the Cardinal offense, and it's all in vain. As the starting pitching did not hold up for you tonight, Lance Lynn didn't have his best stuff. And that's a real shame because this was a night where Ollie Marmel was basically boxed in by previous decisions and by previous uh, circumstances unfolding to letting Lynn go about as long as he could and then some tonight. It wasn't ideal because he wasn't pitching well, but it was the circumstances that basically Ollie Marmel, I think, was was forced to commit to because of where things have been over the past handful of days with this Cardinal bullpen. They were coming into tonight's game, and we got confirmation of this post game. if you watched on Valley Sports Midwest, that Ryan Helsley, JoJo Romero, Andrew Kittredge, and Ryan Fernandez, all four of your top leverage relievers, were unavailable for tonight. They were all down, as Ollie Marmel said. So without any of those guys available to come into the game, Lance Lynn had to have a, a, a deeper outing tonight to give the Cardinals a real chance. And the one exception to that would have been if the offense could just go Hamburglar on this Rodery Munoz fella. And there was a lot of reason to believe that they would be able to do that because coming into the game, Munoz had really bad numbers against lefties this year, like an 1,100 OPS and six homers allowed and only like 40 at-bats. They've been just torching Rodery Munoz. It, like splits that you hardly ever see as drastic as, as they had been for Munoz so far this season. And the Cardinal lefties and one righty and Paul Goldschmidt did indeed get to him. Donovan, two-run shot. Burleson hits a homer. Goldie got things started with the homer. If you're watching on MLB TV, you might not have seen it because it randomly, uh, there's no volume and then there was no game at all. It was kind of weird. I think they got tricked up by the 5-10 start time. That's my only explanation for what was going on there. But the Cardinals absolutely dominated early in this game offensively. They got to Munoz. It's everything you could have hoped for. He allows seven runs, six of them earned in four innings. I mean, that is a great scenario. Three homers off of a guy in four innings just was the perfect setting for the Cardinals to have finally that win that they can coast to. And it's not that difficult, and it's not that stressful. Here's the problem. It didn't materialize. The Marlins kept at Lance Lynn, and Ollie Marmel just had no choice, I think, other than to leave him in the game. I don't love it. And I guess you could have made the argument that, look, Ryan Lutis didn't pitch in this game tonight, and he's going to be off the roster tomorrow unless there's an injury or something else that happens, because not only is Giovanni Gallegos looming, but Kyle Gibson has to come back on the roster from the bereavement list tomorrow, which means that he's, you know, that spot's going to be needed again. So you had Lutus available there, and you didn't use him. I think I would have let Ryan Lutus come into this game in, in, in the early going, as Lance Lynn just clearly did not have it tonight. Um, certainly you'd think to start the sixth inning, that was maybe where you'd, you'd think to do something, but... They were trying to get him through because they understand that the bullpen isn't very well rested. Half of them were unavailable tonight, essentially. But that's the thing. is like, Lutus, if he's out there, there's maybe reason because you know that the bereavement list is ending for Gibson tomorrow and he's coming back onto the roster to make his start that you might have been willing to use him. But would that have been effective? Would that have been any better than Lance Lynn? He, he settled in for a scoreless fifth inning, so maybe that was where Ali Marmel thought just squeeze one more inning out of him. But it is interesting that it's almost in direct, uh, not correlation, it's the opposite of what he had been doing with starters so far over the last few weeks, really the last few days when it comes to, you can think back to the Miles Michaelis start when he only had 62 pitches. I didn't mind that one, taking him out, because I thought you did have your bullpen lined up, and that was a day that it really felt like the Cardinals needed to win a game. Uh, so that was the way that it went there, and that was within the last couple of weeks. But then even more recently, it was Palante on Saturday, three and a third innings before he's pulled for Roy Croft, and then tonight, or pardon me, last night, it was uh, Sonny Gray, who had only thrown 84 pitches, was pulled from the game before the Jazz Chisholm at bat, 
Obviously, the matchup there against Chisholm was not favorable. We talked a lot about this last night, but Jojo Romero walks him, and that's the one thing that you couldn't do in that spot. And so last night, Sonny Gray gets a no decision despite pitching brilliantly for the majority of his outing, and he just it leaves a sour taste in your mouth because he didn't have a chance to make his own mess and clean up his own mess, if you will. And so that was frustrating last night, and it wasn't a case. We didn't hear post game like I thought we might, that Sonny Gray would say, oh, no, I asked to be taken out. No, he said, I had the mindset since the fourth inning that I was going to finish this game. So attack, guys, you're going to finish this game. Uh, and he, he didn't, but it all worked out because they won, right? Well, yes and no. That game ended up lasting 12 innings last night. You burned Ryan Fernandez up. He pitched incredibly well, but you had to do it in order to try and win that game that was right there on the table for you last night. They eventually did win the game, but at what cost? Well, it's the cost of doesn't really matter what kind of outing Lance Lynn is going to have on Tuesday. He's going to pitch, and he's going to pitch some more, and then after that he's going to pitch a little bit more. Dolly Marble didn't really have a choice, and it was unfortunate that that lines up with Lance Lynn having one of his worst outings of the season, but we've also seen Lance Lynn struggle pretty mightily recently, whereas tonight he did complete the fifth inning, but that was not the case his previous three outings. He had been removed from the game before finishing off the fifth, and so he has been struggling, and and I think that was uh, placed under the microscope even a little bit more tonight as the Cardinals blow uh, what what ostensibly was one of their top performances offensively of the season. It was the time where you finally see, hey, this is what it lines up against the opposing starter to be, and it ended up being exactly that. The Cardinals beat this guy up as they should for pitchers who come in with uh, presenting these types of numbers, especially against left-handed batters. He just hasn't been able to do anything against them, and the Cardinals stacked their lineup with as many lefties as they could squeeze in there. They even added another one later on with Dylan Carlson coming into the lineup late after we initially were expected to see Brandon Crawford play third base for the first time in his major league career. I'm still interested to see if that ever happens. But Mason Wynn was scratched late due to illness. Ollie Marmel said he was vomiting before the game, uh, rested up, and, and felt like he could have potentially taken it in that bat if needed. But that was the explanation for why the late scratch there. Uh, but man, I mean, this was just the type of scenario you would, would dream up against Rodery Munoz, and the fact that the Cardinals aren't able to take advantage makes this probably, I'm not going to just use the hyperbole and say, oh, it's the worst loss of the season. It's the most annoying loss of the season. If not, it's top two or three. You can let me know in the comments if there's a, another one that I'm missing, but this was annoying. It's like a gnat, the fact that the Cardinals didn't win this game when finally the offense delivered the thing that y'all have been waiting to see for so long. They did that. They beat up on a starter who they were supposed to beat up on, and what did it get him? Nothing, except for a, a more beleaguered bullpen and more questions about the viability right now of Lance Lynn. Uh, Jared, thank you so much, man, for the super chat. What I will say is, and I don't think it'll be a problem tonight because we don't have as many viewers, uh, but certainly last night there were comments that slipped through the cracks I wasn't able to get to. Super chats, I'll, they'll always get read, and member comments will always get read um, as long as, as I can see them um, because I got to kind of prioritize those folks. But, but I'm going to try to read all these comments tonight. And I think we'll be able to pretty much pull it off. But Jared, thank you for the super chat. He says, hey, Palante, greater than Lynn. Can you combine them to equal a good starter from uh, like three from each and add a four spot or a higher arm in trade? Yeah, I don't know about the piggybacking idea because that basically limits your your roster in a way that's that's kind of a bummer on the other four days. I understand the point, And there are times that I feel like this often comes up when the Cardinals have two guys that feel like number five starters and maybe you could just smash them together and make him one really good starter. But the point is that like Lance Lynn hasn't gone very deep in games effectively, and Palante you know, hasn't been given the opportunity to do so. I honestly think Palante is better served to be allowed to throw 80, 90 pitches and get through some of the, the issues that are going to crop up. And honestly, the one on Saturday, what bothered me about it is he didn't pitch badly. It's not like he was walking, guys. He gave up a hit. Guys do that. And then he gave up another hit on a hit and run where Mason Wynn, if he would have just been standing there instead of Bellinger stealing second base and, and Wynn goes to cover, even though there was a right-handed batter up, which there was an explanation for from the Cardinals, but I just still was like, oh man, that's one of those that it's not really Plante's fault, right? That's double play ball. Instead, it's first and third, nobody out. Oh boy, you're up a creek without a paddle. But then he strikes out Ian Happ and it's like, okay, let's see what Plante can do here. But instead, they went a different direction. And that gets into, and I'll start to read the comments after I, I kind of touch on the Chris Roycroft thing because I imagine some of the questions will be about that. He comes in tonight in another leverage situation. First time we've seen him after 
uh, what happened on Saturday. Uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. Did he pitch in another game recently? Because if he did, I I messed that up in the uh, the article I wrote for KMOV because I just kind of figured he didn't. But regardless, what we see from these two kind of marquee scenarios for Chris Roycroft, who is the less experienced, you know, a rookie status, and and yeah, this was his most recent outing after the Cubs game on Saturday. He's not fielding his position defensively. And that's something you really cannot have if you are the guy that comes in to throw a sinker and to and do soft ground ball contact. You kind of figure he's going to end up being part of the party as a fielder, whether that means the ball's got to be hit to him and he's got to make a play at first, whether it's hit to Goldschmidt and he's got to remember to cover first. Um, it's it's like the little things. It's those intangibles that you got to remember it's great to throw 90 some odd with sink and be able to induce this soft contact. The job's not done though at that point. Right. So it's kind of hard for me to hear all these say, you know, yeah, it's, he's continuing to do his part. Well, not really. Like he, he needs to be doing his part defensively and it, you don't want to harp on a guy, but you also notice those two key spots. That's been the differentiator that he hasn't been able to maybe rise above. Uh, it was just an execution thing on Saturday tonight. I think it was a bit of a mental block that you've got to know where to be and give yourself a chance to get out of that inning. They give you a base runner for free in the 10th inning. So you, you've got to be on top of every potential out that you can record, and that ended up being a costly play tonight for Roy Croft and the Cardinals. Even when Bruhan came up, though, I was thinking, man, they're probably getting this ground ball and getting out of this inning, but they poke it through the middle of the infield, and that was all she wrote. I thought the infield was playing a little bit in. I don't really know what the deal was with that, but it was just it was just hit up, up the middle well enough, hit it where they ain't, but all Bruhan. Uh, superstar of MLB The Show 2020 coming through and getting the win for the Marlins. Brutal way for the Cardinals to lose. But when it comes to the Roycroft stuff, it's like, it's weird it's happened twice, right? I understand he's maybe got some nerves, not used to high leverage, but you'd really like to see if the Cardinals are going to continue to insist that he's one of these guys. Okay, like I think the stuff plays at that level, but there are other things you have to make sure you're doing in order for when the manager says, that's my guy in the 10th, it's like, all right, but is he going to have a mental lapse or is there going to be something else that, aside from his pitching, that comes into play and you're sort of left wondering if he's going to be able to make the play? That's something that I, like, it's weird and I, I feel uncomfortable even kind of talking about it, but it's twice in a row that it's happened. And so I do think it's a little bit relevant to say, hey, uh, pitching-wise, maybe he's up for the task, but... Uh, in terms of the whole role of a pitcher, is he up for the task of being a leverage guy right now? And if not, does does Ollie Marmel need to be forcing the issue quite to that extent? Well, when you have Helsley, JoJo, Kittredge, and Fernandez down, I think the answer is probably generally going to be yes because he's who they had left, right? Him or Ryan Lutis, so take your pick. And Roycroft has had a, a lot more experience uh, in, in the last few weeks as somebody that they're relying upon in these settings. So it sucks that it went down that way. More than anything, it sucks that the Cardinal offense was wasted tonight. Eight runs scored, seven in regulation, scored in the first four innings, got three home runs off the starter. Uh, you'd like to be able to add on. Like, that's still when the game is in is in question, and you're seeing Lance Lynn giving up runs, and so you know it's not actually over at this point, even though you have a lead. That would be where you'd like to see them add on and not just sort of say, hey, we did our job. But when they score seven runs in nine innings, you you really just need to win that game. And Lance Lynn didn't have it, and they needed to keep him pitching there because they didn't have the bullpen arms to be able to get through uh, to, to get through very much else if they didn't. So that's a bummer. Lutis would be the one guy that I would have said could have thrown you a couple of innings tonight, and maybe he gives up three runs because he's kind of a fringe guy on this roster. But Leahy did his job. John Kings looked really good. It's a shame to have lost this game. Going to take a sip of water and jump into the comments here. So get him in, get him in, get him in. Ryan, appreciate you. He says, love the channel. And Ryan also sent me a DM on Twitter. He was excited for the live tonight. Allison, good evening. Yeah, two nights in a row. Um, there, You've heard some of my breakdown on how it fell apart. But this, um, you know, I figured tonight would be a night where I would be able to do it. Again, I'm going to Birmingham on Thursday. So I don't know what the whole thing is going to be, if I'm going to be able to Thursday night squeeze in a podcast or what it's going to look like. But promise, even if you have to wait a day, I will make sure to recap eventually all the the goings on in Birmingham should be a fun time down there um and she mentions you think you're in for an easy series with Miami but two games in extra innings are we going to see position players have to pitch tomorrow 
Kyle Gibson needs seven innings. I mean, that's that's kind of the, the, the gauntlet being thrown down on that whole situation because you're right. The, the bullpen is uh, a little bit tired, but you had four guys not pitch tonight, so hopefully some of them are available. Like Helsley should be available in a closing situation t- tomorrow. And then we'll see about Gallegos. Like, they could bring Gallegos back if they decide, look, you know, Roy Croft has thrown a couple times recently. Maybe the I, I got to check and see how many pitches he threw tonight, but maybe it's a case where – even though he's somebody that's kind of working his way into leverage, they would say we're gonna we're gonna swap him out for somebody to get a fresh arm in here. That could be the one benefit of Geo, but also the downside would be you, you you would need Geo to pitch, and that I don't know how anybody would be super comfortable with that after the results that we've seen from him on the rehab. Roy Croft only threw eighteen. I don't think you can send him down. The stuff still plays. Leahy only threw sixteen pitches. The stuff still plays. So I think you're looking at sending Lutis down for Gibson, but like. Who's the answer when it comes to bringing Geo back on? I don't really know how you figure that. I really don't. And the performance from him has not dictated that they should. So they might be using up as much of this clock as they can before, you know, they've got him there waiting in the wings. I think he threw a bullpen yesterday. But we'll see what the the choices end up being there for the Cardinals. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see who is available tomorrow because Ryan Helsey was unavailable tonight, but he did not pitch last night, right? So this was a case where... At least I don't think he did. But a case where, like, sometimes you need two days in a row, and that really is going to hamstring, which I get it. You can't throw, like, if guys are throwing 81 times throughout a season, that they're pitching every other day, and sometimes they go back-to-back. That ends up being a little bit much, right? And Helsley didn't pitch last night, but Fernandez and Kittredge both threw two innings, um, and and JoJo obviously didn't perform well, but had, had 12 pitches that he threw. So hopefully JoJo should be ready to go for Wednesday, as far as Fernandez and Kittredge, I don't know. Maybe it would be a spot where they would need two days in a row off, or maybe that was just something that they needed for Helsley, so we'll see. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see on Wednesday. If Gibby is not able to go deep, it could be a tough one. And we know that the Marlins were kind of a troubled spot for Gibson. Remember when he faced him first week or so of the season, had that six-run first inning. That was against Miami. So we'll see tomorrow what it looks like for him. Uh, they'll they'll need him to be great. It's it's what they needed from Lynn tonight, and it didn't happen. Look, they didn't even need greatness from Lynn tonight. They just needed mediocrity. They needed five innings and three runs, or six innings and three runs, and they, he wasn't able to to answer the bell on that, which is a bummer. I mean, it's been a recent trend for him, for sure. Icta says, uh, woot therapy time after the worst loss of the year. Most annoying loss of the year, for sure. Is it the worst? I'll let you guys decide that, but definitely a tough one against a bad team when you scored nine. Uh, we scored eight, rather. You should win that game, for sure. It's a bad loss. Uh, Ryan says, if Sonny went deeper yesterday, bullpen would not have been in the situation it was in today. 100%. Because if Sonny finishes that game tomorrow, uh, last night, JoJo can pitch tonight, right? Like, that's another guy that you would have had because he wouldn't have had to have pitched. And let's say they let Sonny Gray have that opportunity to finish the eighth. Cardinals are, and let's say he gets it done. He needed one more out, guys. Like, this is where the downstream effect, and I already wrote about this for KMOV, so check it out, firstalert4.com slash sports. I wrote that article from 9 to 10 o'clock tonight before I was able to come on here and do what I'm doing now. Um, Basically, my point with this article was the decisions that were made over the past few days by Ollie Marmel to be a little more aggressive in pulling those relievers, or pardon me, pulling those starters is ultimately how you ended up with the situation you ended up with tonight. And do we know for sure that Sonny Gray would have gotten through that spot there in the eighth yesterday? No. Maybe it's a home run for Chisholm. But I believe De La Cruz was 0 for 3 against Sonny at that point. So even with with then the tying run coming up, do you make a decision to even push Sonny a little bit further toward 100 pitches if he was willing to do it? And maybe you get out of that with the lead and then you don't need all those innings from Fernandez and Kittredge. I mean, those guys both threw two innings. They both would have been available today. Or at least one of them would have been. You know, whoever was closing the game out last night, Helsley was unavailable, so somebody else it would have been. But you probably have JoJo and Fernandez available tonight, or JoJo and Kittredge would have been available tonight, and that would have meant, yeah, we can go to Leahy or John King or Roy Croft or Lutis in the fourth inning when it's clear that Lance Lynn just doesn't have it. Like, that had an effect. And I'm not trying to rip Ollie Marmel the way that I think some people out there are because I think it's tougher than we acknowledge it is to make these decisions. But it just goes to show that even if a decision can seem reasonable and you have a defense for it and you have an explanation for it in the moment, when you make it too many times in a week, 
this can happen. And it's, look, the fact that JoJo didn't pan out last night was not anticipated by anybody. In theory, he just gets out of that inning and you still have maybe an inning available from Fernandez or Kittredge tonight and maybe JoJo, uh, you know, if he only has to face the one batter Chisholm instead of walking him, maybe JoJo is available tonight as well for at least a couple few outs. But that wasn't the case because it spiraled on the Cardinals and you have to eventually answer the bell for that. It came home to roost that when the decision to take Sonny Gray out of his own game, and if he was the one that allowed two homers to tie it, then so be it. But when that goes wrong on you, not only do you lose Romero, but you had to lose the other guys because of how long the game lasted, 12 innings last night. That's where it goes wrong. So, yeah, Ryan, if Sonny gets to throw to one more batter or even two more batters last night, it might have been completely different. Or if JoJo doesn't walk Chisholm, like I get it, but that's execution and that's stuff that as a manager you're having to deal with. You're not putting in the guy for the situation to say what happens if he fails. I got to be ready for that. You're going, he's going to succeed. But when he doesn't, Sometimes these downstream effects absolutely do take shape. ICTA says 6-6 six and six against the bottom three teams in the league is going to be looked at hard if they miss the playoffs by three games. Yeah, who is that then? The White Sox, the Rockies, and right now the Marlins, I think is, is maybe the three teams you're talking about. Um, those are the three that come to mind for me, and you split with the Rockies. You're right now splitting uh, with the Marlins, although they played them obviously earlier in the season at Bush, and uh, then you lost the series to the White Sox. So, yep. Those are those twelve games. You want to be eight and four, you know, at a minimum in those, and they just haven't done it. They haven't been able to beat up on the bad teams. John and Dean says, "How many tokens for shirt off?" I don't think I'm taking my shirt off, but I will say this: I have gone since late May. Uh, I think the actual day of it was Memorial Day. Came back from the, the the family farm, did some eating and drinking over that weekend. Let's be honest, and I was like, "All right." Physically, we've got to get it on. we got to get it together. And since that day, the Tuesday after Memorial Day, I have logged at least 10,000 steps every single day. And even on Hot Take Central, I have talked openly about, all right, here's my weight. Here's my goal weight. I turned 30 on July 1st, and I'm going to try like heck to get closer to my goal before I turn 30 because I feel like after I turn 30, it's never going to happen. And so I have been hitting it hard. I went to uh, Forest Park today, played pickleball with John Denton, uh, Daniel Guerrero, and Polo Asensio. We had a, a fun time playing doubles pickleball. John Denton uh, was king of the court for sure, but I got some great exercise in. So uh, maybe the point of this story, John and Dean, is that one of these days, maybe shirt off will happen. I know that's Kyle Reese's thing, but uh, if I get into good shape, I might eventually have to just have to own that. So we'll see. Uh, but the, thank you for the question and for the uh for the commentary. We're having a good time here. Uh, let's see. Brett says, can't really complain about the offense tonight. They did a lot of the things we've been asking from them, but Lance Lynn didn't do his job, and the bullpen was too taxed to finish it off. Brett, that's honestly like the boilerplate statement of this of this game and of this loss for the Cardinals is everything you just said. Offense finally did what Cardinals fans had wanted to see from them, and it's not that the Cardinals fans were ever wrong to ask for what, what they wanted to see. Like, this should be a team, if you're a contender, and you're going to help out your bullpen, you're going to help out your rotation, you should have a game every, I don't know, week to 10 days at least where you you just pummel the opposing starter and you put up those runs early and are, are able to coast to a finish. But the starter at least has to be mediocre, and Lynn was not that. He was he was below that level tonight. Phillip says they're allergic to being over 500. Uh, saw that Matt's is being evaluated. Think he starts again. Yeah, I mean... It's tough. I don't think the Cardinals know for sure what they want to do with Steven Matz. Um, I think they probably ultimately put him back in there because it's not like they've shown a ton of faith in Palante, but I don't think Lance Lynn gets pulled from the rotation. I know that's something that people are probably going to harp on after tonight, but I tend to believe that Palante will be the one that has a lot less um, less traction and, and faith in terms of the, guy, the organization and, and believing in him. So I don't think Lynn's spot is in danger, even though he's ob- objectively pitched worse than Palante since Palante joined the rotation. Palante's had one bad game. He's had two good ones, and he's had one that was cut short by a managerial decision that is more of an incomplete than anything else. He actually pitched well, in my opinion, in that game. So just my two cents. Braden says, honestly, is it crazy to say I'm not worried right now? It's not crazy. They're still 500. They're still in a playoff spot, I presume. I guess I should check out the standings because there were probably like six teams that were a game below 500, and if all of them won, then technically 
there are a lot of ties going on right now. So I'll update you real quick on the the wild card picture after the Cardinals lose again uh, to one of these teams that you don't want to be losing to, and we understand that. But uh, nope, no 500 teams just yet. The Diamondbacks are a game under. The Giants are two under, and the Cardinals will see them this weekend starting in Birmingham Thursday. The Mets and Nats are two under, and Mike Schultz Padres are tail spinning. They've lost five in a row to drop to uh, if the Braves are in first in the wild card, Cardinals are second. Uh, the the Padres are now seventh, and the Reds and Pirates and Cubs are nipping at their heels. Everybody within a game and a half of a wild card spot. Uh, there's there's literally seven teams on the outside looking in, all of them within a game and a half of Arizona. And the Cardinals are just a half game up on the D-backs. So, like, uh, the bleep is crazy. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot going on here. A lot going on here. But is it crazy to not be worried, Braden? No, because, I mean, the Cardinals are still in position to make something happen. But, man, it's frustrating to have the offensive explosion and not win. That truly sucks. I mean, it's just not what you wanted to see. Ryan says Teoscar struck out to end the game. Ump said it was a ball. Three run go ahead, Homer. Um, yeah, that uh that's been happening around baseball this year, has it not? MLB umpires injecting themselves in the game. Uh that's fun for the the Dodgers. They really needed something to to boost them up after the injuries they've suffered over the weekend. Uh Yamamoto down, Mookie down, that stinks for them. But they beat the Rockies because that's what you're supposed to do to the Rockies. So anyway. Uh, Ryan wants everybody to tune in to 590 tomorrow morning, 7 to 10 a.m., be safe. Uh, Cole, Cam, I guess Tuna will be there, huh? I kind of forget about which days he's in because I'm normally only in on Fridays. Brett says, make sure I didn't miss anybody. Brett says, should have expected to not be able to sweep the fish. Don't sweep bad teams, but should be able to take tomorrow's game with Gibby on the bump. Hopefully the same kind of offense going forward. Yeah, if anything, it's like, you want that to be the jump starter for the offense. Granted, I think they they face one of the worst starters in baseball today. Um, I, I don't think for a, a competent team, Munoz would really be getting run. But they were able to do exactly what you're supposed to do to those types of guys. And so I think you can feel good about that. Dylan wants to know if we can start the all-star campaign for Alec Burleson yet. And um, you can. It's just not going to matter. Because he was 10th on Monday when they announced the the uh, the update for the, the National League voting. Tenth among DHs. I think he's categorized as a DH for whatever reason. He's got 10 homers now, hitting 749 OPS. Um, probably not quite enough to be an all-star, to be honest with you, but he's certainly been a, a, a performer for this Cardinals team that they have needed. Jared asks, when was the last time that Lance Lynn did have his best stuff? Because I've commented, and I, I wrote tonight for KMOV, that he didn't have his best stuff tonight. Um, do 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 and I'm looking up the answer to that. I, sorry, I went on Lance Lynn's baseball reference page and I saw something about Aloy Menez, and I thought it said that he was designated for assignment, but it said designated hitter has been sent to the Florida Complex uh, League to rehab. The last time Lance Lynn had his best stuff was May 21st. He went six innings, one run, no earned, five strikeouts. That was his best start um, and, and the only time that he's allowed fewer than three runs since the beginning of May. April 28th was five innings, one run. May 21st, six innings, zero runs earned, one run. And then on the 27th, he gave up three runs, but only one of them earned against the Reds. It's just not been consistent for Lance Lynn, and he has not been an innings eater either. He's been kind of the, the opposite. He taps out after about 75, 80 pitches, and then you see things sometimes start to, to skid on him from there. It's not what they were looking for, but Gibby has at least answered the bell, which is good to see. Kyle, welcome. He says maybe we shouldn't have four high leverage relievers, and they should all have more of an equal role, aside from Helsley having the ninth. Yeah, here's what I would say. And look, this sounds dumb tonight because my contention last night was Libertor needs to be given some of those more high leverage spots against lefties late, the way that they did JoJo last night. You could have maybe put Libertor in that spot against Chisholm uh, if if JoJo has been a little bit overused. But then, of course, Libby, for the first time since coming out of the rotation tonight, he gives up an, an earned run in the sixth inning there, which is a big-time bummer. Uh, because it makes me look dumb. <laughs> but no, I think Libby would be a guy, and then Ryan Fernandez is obviously a guy that you kind of give more of those seventh and eighth inning opportunities so that it's not always JoJo and Kittredge. And then you're trying to find one more guy that can be capable of being in that setup group. I, I don't think I'm there on Roycroft yet, not because his stuff's not good, but because I don't think he's got the complete makeup as a pitcher right now. I need to see him do the little things well. I think it can happen, and it may happen in his next outing, but I need to see that before I'm 
convinced. And John King is another one that, like, he's going to be throwing in those seventh, eighth inning opportunities too because uh, you, you kind of you're you're desperate for other guys that can do it. And he's answered the bell so far. He's had a really nice season. Really nice season. Allison asked for a side tangent on my favorite Willie Mays memory story. And it's not that I really have many. It's just, I mean, everybody has seen that amazing catch in, in the World Series, I believe it was. Um, and it's just a shame that he passes at age 93, literally two days before we're all going down to Birmingham to celebrate at a stadium that he played um, and just a legend of the game. And it was known, I guess, within the last few days that he wasn't going to be able to be there for it because of uh, the, the turn that his health had taken but to see him go is really tough, man, and the timing's tough. But you know what? You try to look at the bright side of things and to know that, A, he went 93 years and 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 lived a heck of a life, and, B, we're all going to be very cognizant, not that we wouldn't have been anyway, but aware and ready to celebrate his legacy at Rickwood Field on Thursday. I am so excited to get down there. It's going to be tricky for me to drive down there Wednesday night. I'm hoping that I can record a B-Shape Daily Probably not alive, but a B-Shape Daily before 4 p.m. My radio show on KTGR that I do out there in Columbia. Um, I do it from here, but I, I'm on the air in Columbia, Missouri. Cardinals games like 11.30, 11.40 start. So if it's done by 2 or so, 2.30, I can put together a quick half hour to talk about the game that I will post then at the normal like 9 p.m., 10 p.m. hour. I'll post it right away for channel members because if y'all want to see the, the stuff right after the game, Great, but I want to kind of, sometimes I have to strategically schedule YouTube things out so that I'm at least giving you guys content on a, on a decent interval. So for channel members, you'll get it right away if I can post it by 3 or 4 o'clock. Um, but then I'm basically taking off shortly after my show ends. We'll put the baby to bed and um, because he likes me to be there for that when I can be, and I like it too. I like it too. But then I'm driving to Birmingham, so I'm going to be there like in the wee hours Thursday, get a quick nap you know, 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. or whatever it ends up being, and get on out to Rickwood Field. So it's going to be a, a whirlwind couple of days, but hopefully worth it. But, yeah, Allison, appreciate you mentioning Willie Mays, and it's sad that we lost him today, for sure. Um, John and Dean says he's got a two-part question. Are JoJo and Kittredge going to be Marvel's version of Manus and Bowman? Um, Maybe. I mean, I think... I think Manus and Bowman weren't quite as high leverage. They were always like six, seventh inning guys, it seemed to me, rather than like JoJo and Kittredge are set up slash closers almost. Um, but the, but the, the usage, look, the usage pitch-wise is not as high, but then it is fair to say that if you if you sort it out by uh, appearances, relief appearances, I do think then JoJo certainly ranks a little bit higher. I, I touted the fact that he's not among the top 30 and no Cardinal is, in pitches thrown by relievers this season. We talked about that last night. But in fairness, I will give you the the stat updated per MLB.com of relief appearances. Because I, I do think that's something else that you can measure and understand that, hey, if a guy like JoJo hasn't pitched this often throughout a season in his career, then it's going to come back to bite him potentially. Number of guys have thrown 36 times. Number of guys in MLB have thrown 35. TJ McFarland, 35 appearances with Oakland. Good for him, man. He's got a three and a half ERA. I I am maybe a little surprised that he's been able to do it, but that's that's good to see for him. He's a good dude. Former Cardinal, of course. Andrew Kittredge, though, is tied for eighth in the league with 34 appearances. So yeah, he's been used a little bit more heavily. Now he's tied with like five or six other guys. So he's among 13 pitchers that have thrown 34 relief appearances or more this season, which is, yeah, he's been used and Jojo is, is in that next crop of, of guys has been, has been used 33 times and that's tied for 14th, but it's tied with like a million other guys. Um, that's like the top 25. And then Ryan Helsley has thrown 32 games. He's tied with a million guys for 26th. And so like that is three Cardinals relievers in the top 30 ish of MLB relievers in games pitched. So that's your triumvirate. I understand the point that although their pitches and their workload in those games, maybe not as much because they're pitching more often, but shorter stints because of their effectiveness. Usually they haven't been, hasn't haven't been needed to throw a bunch of pitches in a lot of those outings because they've been really good, but that's a good point. They're going to have to figure something else out. And that's why I would say I'm, I'm looking to the relief trade market sooner than later, but they're not going to do anything until they decide on what to do with geo. And so geo is going to have to come back. 
he's going to have to pitch badly for a time and then they DFA him or he's going to pitch well and can become an option again. But that's going to have to happen at some point. And I just don't know that, that Roy Croft has settled into being a reliable leverage guy just yet. Fernandez has certainly done so, but he's been heavily used as well. Kyle Leahy has done a nice job, but he's kind of fitting in that middle innings role more so. So that's kind of where it's at on that, John and Dean. And then question number two from John and Dean is Cole also insufferable in person. I actually really like Cole from from Hot Take Central. I don't know. I, I know that it's kind of like fun to, to rip on him, but I think he's a really good dude. I think he's a little green. There's some things he doesn't know, but that's just because he's young. I was young once, and I still am relative to, 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 uh, to some other people, right, turning 30 in July. But uh, Cole, I think his, his heart's in the right place, and I think his head's largely in the right place. I like Cole. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to admit that on the air, but I like Cole. So, no, he's not insufferable in person. Mike says this team can't get both the offense and pitching to do well at the same time. It's one or the other. Yeah, I think a lot of teams deal with that, but that's kind of the way it's gone for sure. Uh, Allison checking in on the rehab for Wilson. He went one for three. He DH, though. He's going to catch five innings tomorrow. One for three, scored a run was the situation for Wilson today with Memphis. Ryan believes Ollie is to blame for recent issues with Gray. You know, I, he he um, Gray hasn't really had issues other than he was pulled early. Like, he's had some bad starts, but I don't think Ollie is to blame when a pitcher pitches badly. I'm going to push back on that. But uh, you could make the case that he pulled him too early yesterday and that it led to lack of bullpen options tonight. Yeah, I, I think you can make that case. Space Magic Storm said that Lynn is only going to get worse Likely going to have five good games all year, including the good ones that he's already had. It's really sad. I don't know if he's going to get worse, but uh, the Cardinals need him to get better. What do you do with Lynn if we want Palante starting? That's from Jared. Well, I'm just saying Lynn's going to start. I don't know that Palante is going to keep his spot when Mance comes back. I think Lynn has more of a stranglehold on the spot, whether that makes you happy or not. I'm just, that's my prediction. I'm not saying what should happen to me. I, you know, there's a, there's a debate to be had. How many, how many mediocre Lance Lynn starts are you going to see before you think, is he bringing as much to the table as Palante? Like, the, it's going to be in the numbers. So, I don't know. But for right now, no, I just don't think I see the Cardinals moving Lynn out. It just, I, I don't, I think that would be, they're going to say it's premature. And I understand because he's a veteran and you brought him in for a reason. But uh, 100%, that's kind of where it's at. I just don't, I, I think Palante's, look, I mean, you just, the proof is in the pudding. Lance Lynn got to throw 97 pitches tonight. I know the circumstances were what they were. He pitched way worse than Palante was pitching on Saturday. And Palante got to throw 59. So there is not faith in Palante internally. That's my that's my takeaway. Adam says, Brendan, you mentioned playing Pajes more, but why not Herrera? He's still super young. His framing has improved from last year. He's a top prospect. Framing and caught stealing numbers should improve with time. Framing, yes. Caught stealing is a huge concern. He, they run freely against him. And this was the, the first time. And, like, look, this was a night where Paz didn't catch and the Cardinals gave up a ton of runs. I'm not saying that's Herrera's fault, but it has been matching up with the trend lines for the most part recently. Paz has done a much better job behind the plate than Herrera, and I would frankly not probably start Herrera behind the plate at all until Wilson comes back. I DH him because he's done a nice job hitting. Paz has been elite behind the plate, and Herrera has been... Uh, subpar. Um, and most of it's because of the throwing arm and, and the, the ability to just run freely against him. But that's a huge thing. That handicaps the pitching staff significantly. I do believe Herrera will improve. I'm not giving up on him as a catcher long term. But right now, with wins being as important as they are, I would be playing Pajes every day um, until Wilson's back, which probably is viable because Wilson could be back by, I think, Saturday is potentially as soon as Wilson could be back. So uh, maybe that's premature, but I, it wouldn't shock me if it, if it happened. But I get you, Adam, like Herrera has improved. He's still pretty deficient in some areas, and it's showing up almost every time he catches. And tonight it wasn't necessarily his fault, but like Pajes has called great games for the starters, and we have seen Herrera maybe be more hit and miss. But is that is it fair because he's been paired with Lynn more often, and Lynn struggled? So I'm not I'm not trying to put that on Herrera. It's almost more about how great Pajes has been. Um, he has been elite, really, in, um, in in what he's done behind the plate. It's not even as much about his offense. I think his offense. I, I love him. I think he's a little. It's a little fluky that he hits two home runs in a weekend at Wrigley. Like one of them was wind blown. One of them he managed to get get gone through the wind. But I, I probably a little bit fluky. 
I don't think he's as good of a hitter as as uh, Herrera at this point, but I think what they need behind the plate is is what Pajas is bringing. So I would continue to start him. Uh, Cardinals 2 for 10 with Risp, by the way, tonight, as I was looking through the box score there. Uh, Jason took one message away, but he did say, thoughts on Contreras saying he's still going to set up close to the plate, even though he fractured his forearm because of how close he set up to the plate. Yeah, he said that the very night of the injury, and I was like, okay, buddy, that's interesting, but it's it made him so good that I, I think he is going to continue to do it, and I get it, man. When you when you understand that that's what is valued from your position and you've spent your whole career having people tell you what you couldn't do and then you figured out a way to be be a lead again at something behind the plate, you're going to want to keep doing that. Um, Cardinals need him in the lineup, though, so I would hope that there is they, they can curb that enthusiasm a little bit. But at the same time, like this is a trend that some of the best catchers are doing is they're setting up really close to try and steal those strikes. And my goodness, how many strikes did Pa has steal the other day? I mean, he's been doing it, too. I don't know that he's setting up as close. We don't really have that angle when the game's going on to be able to see. But, the, but Jason, it's a fair question, and I understand you asking it. Do I think he's going to do anything differently? Hell no. I think he's going to continue to do it because he knows it works. Adam, thank you so much as well for the uh, the super thanks. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, John and Dean, Herrera gets run on more than a nine-year rec league catcher. That's not nice to say, but it's also, uh, you know, kind of not that false. It's been, like, really, it's deficient to the extent that I wouldn't play him right now um, because I think that Pajas has just been so good that I would play Herrera at DH anytime that there's a, a, a good matchup to do it. I think his bat plays. But, uh, yeah, I I really do understand the idea that you would that you would try to avoid him catching because of the arm thing. And tonight, I don't think they stole any bases against him. Well, actually, no, they did. They, they were... There was some hit and run that was put on. That was something that was utilized as well. Um, and Anderson did have a stolen base off of Lynn in the fourth inning. So, you know, that uh, it, it came back to, or pardon me, I don't know what inning it was. It was number four on the year for Anderson. Offhand, I do not remember what inning it was. I'm not going to lie to you and say I do. But, yeah, you know, that, that's part of it. That's part of the Herrera experience right now. We don't have to make too much of it, but I think it is a factor. It, it, we would be silly to ignore it as one. Brett uh, has a few comments here that if I can click properly, I'll be able to read them. Tonight's game was definitely the most annoying, but I feel like tomorrow will be the Gibby revenge game. Yeah, listen, he gave up six runs to the Marlins in that first inning. I think he was tipping pitches. He went and shoved for the next five innings, only allowing one run, and was able to give the Cardinals a a deep outing. It wasn't a good outing, but he was able to get deep in the game for the Cardinals in that early April matchup, and so we'll see if he gets revenge on him tomorrow afternoon. Uh, early start time, so be ready. Brett says, domino effect all season, though. Little decisions topple over, lead to losing winnable games, and it's happened like three times this season. Yeah, it's been more common than you want to see. Trent, welcome in, says, just want to say hello, getting ready to have a new baby boy sometime on Thursday, maybe Friday. Expected to be over 10 pounds. Tough Cardinals loss. Uh, That's a big boy. Uh, Trent, congratulations. Really an exciting time for you and your family. Um, I'll I'll keep you in in my thoughts for sure as as you're going through uh, the the, uh, a very interesting time over the coming days. Um, get your sleep now while you, t- while you can, my man. That's that's what I know. Uh, Wanda says that Flaherty, Jack Flaherty, 100 strikeouts, only 11 walks in a 301 ERA. Yeah, he's been incredible. Uh, he's been awesome for the Tigers this year. Jack Flaherty has been really, really good, and you could have kind of seen it coming. Uh, a classic change of scenery guy. What he needs is to stay healthy for three more months and then get to free agency and then take the first – four-year contract that he's offered. Maybe not the first one, but he's going to get a better contract situation if he can just stay healthy. And I'm rooting for him to do it because it's it, baseball's more fun when Jack Flaherty's doing his thing. But boy, oh boy, could the Cardinals have used that version of him. But again, whose fault is it? Because, I mean, he was here. I think it's a health thing. I don't think he was fully healthy, and, and now I, I think he probably is. Check the velocities. That's the first thing I would check to, to ask that question. But I do. I feel good for him. Zach said that Lynn eating, okay, I'm not going to do the fat jokes about Lance Lynn. I get it. He's a big boy, uh, but he's not eating innings. I agree with you there. Uh, yes, rest in peace to Willie Mays. For those who have, have just heard about that tonight, bummer to lose him. Uh, James commenting in on about Willie as well. 660, not a small number either. Nope. I mean, I, we can go ahead and take a moment and check out the numbers for Willie Mays. And just, you know, just in what he, uh, let's see here. Because 
he's got the Negro League stats as well, but now those have been combined with Major League Baseball stats, which is how I think you get to the 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 six sixty. Or did he? He didn't play much in the Negro Leagues, I guess. So he didn't have like home run stats to be to be given there. Yeah, no, he did not. So that's my mistake. But just six hundred sixty home runs, nine nine forty nine OPS, had over three thousand hits. I mean, one of the one of the greats all time. There's no question about that. Willie Mays. And like when you talk about as far as like nicknames go, pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. If your your nickname is Say Hey Kid, it doesn't get much better than that. It doesn't get much more on the cool factor than that, right? Uh Kyle says, I don't think it's just pitches, appearances matter. And yeah, in fair, Mia Culpa, I did mention the appearances and I I even and you know that by now, but I'm just catching up on the comments. Only giving guys three, uh, giving three guys a chance in the seventh, eighth, ninth versus the entire bullpen, getting more equal load. Obviously, you go with the guys that'll get the outs, but you should only use them when you have more options and can get them MLB experience and leverage situations. Yeah, I'm not. I, I don't agree that the whole bullpen should get to be equal. Um, you do have to prove that you can handle it. Like again, I wouldn't put Roy Croft in another spot like that until he kind of works his way into it a little bit more, um, and, and maybe has to field his position a couple of times so I can see it in a lesser environment. But I do agree that there are probably five guys at least that you could give some leverage to, and they've really only been doing it with three guys. Um, so I understand you, Kyle. I, I get where you're coming from, and they the, we did read off the triumvirate has thrown pretty frequently, even if they're not leading the league in pitches. Kyle also says, Pot has his defense and Herrera's bat would be Yachty. Yeah, I mean, it's not crazy to say. Uh, Milky wants to know if anyone's ever told me I look just like Brennan Schaefer, St. Louis Cardinals writer. I've heard it a couple of times. I've heard it a couple of times. Yeah. A couple of times I have. Um, reason Lynn is back is he's older, cheap, and used to be a Cardinal, not a skills. Yeah, but I mean, Kyle Gibson's here, and he didn't used to be a Cardinal. But I hear you. I mean, look, man, if you were able to replace Lance Lynn with Shota Imanaga, I think this people feel real different about this team. But that's easy in hindsight. Like, I thought coming into the year that Lynn would be better than Gibson, would be better than Michaelis. And we just haven't seen that version of him recently. And, uh, you know, it happens. I'm not right about everything. Rarely am I right, right? No, I'm just playing. Benjamin, 500 record. Uh, the platonic Bill DeWitt ideal. All is balanced again. I don't know about that. Remember when they fired Matheny, he said 500 doesn't play in this town with these fans. But, you know, and that's not me saying, well, they should fire the manager. No, they should have a lot more things they're doing with the roster and the front office to be able to put this organization in a better spot. I think if you were just to slap the blame on the manager for what's going on, the last couple of years, I think that would be a, a very incomplete picture of the situation. Uh, Jason says, who goes back down when Walker and O'Brien come back? It is it's too far away to know. Jason, there are going to be injuries. There are going to be a bunch of guys that have to come back before O'Brien and before Walker. Um, now, Walker could happen any day, but O'Brien you know, is going to have to continue. And, and look, I don't think Walker's happening right away either, simply because uh, unless there's an injury to the outfield and he's going to have an obvious spot to play, uh, they're, they're going to Take their time. Now, would I predict Walker within the next two weeks? Yeah, I think he comes up before July 1st simply because I think he's playing better. He's starting to find his mojo in, in Memphis. So when that happens, you want Jordan Walker here. But I don't know who's going down for it, uh, Jason. Geo comes back before O'Brien. Matt's comes back before O'Brien. So they got to figure out those first. Uh, predictions for tomorrow's game. Yeah, Allison, we'll end on this. If I missed anybody's comment, please do throw me a tweet. A uh, DM on Twitter at bshafer12, but Allison wants a prediction for tomorrow. I am going to say that that Kyle Gibson gives the Cardinals what they need in the game tomorrow. Um, I think he gives them that six or seven inning outing. He allows a couple few runs probably because that happens. But the question is, do the Cardinals follow it up offensively with something akin to what they were able to do today? And I'm checking out Yanni Chirinos and his numbers for the Marlins. Um, is this going to be his first appearance of the year? I believe it is. So that's something. <laughs> that's something that's interesting. Um, I don't know what the deal He's 30 years old. I don't know what the deal is if they just recently signed him. Yeah, he, he just got selected from the minors, I suppose. So he's coming up for the first time this year. He, I'm trying to find some minor league stats for Torino's. Has a three ERA in the minors. Not a lot of strikeouts. 
Seems like the kind of guy that could shove against the Cardinals, even though he has no business doing it. But if they can take the kind of at-bats they did today, I think there's certainly a chance that the Cardinals end up doing really well tomorrow. But since I, I did think coming in they would win the series, I'm going to stick with that prediction and say the Cardinals win it 5-3 to three tomorrow. It's too close for comfort, which does mean the bullpen's going to have to be strained once again. But um, I think that's what's going to end up happening. Uh, one more for the road. Zach says that the offense could have a decisive win every now and then. Bullpen would be in a lot better shape. Can't remember a single blowout win this season. There's been like one, maybe two, but you're right. It's It's been few and far between, Zach. So that is going to be where we end things here. I, I went even later than I wanted to because I got to wake up at 6 a.m. for Hot Take Central. 590 thefancafns.com tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. to 10. Check it out. I'll be on the show. Cam Jansen, Cole Bartimas, other cast and crew will be around. If you want more Cardinals talk and general sports talk, that's where you go tomorrow morning. Jack is watching from Como tonight. M-I-Z. Man, oh man, I can't wait to be there on November 9th. Okay, that's going to do it for this edition of the show. Appreciate you guys as always. And we'll talk to you next time on Be Shape Daily and Be Shape Daily Live. Peace.